fun. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And this is my pleasure to give lectures on understanding and interpreting pulmonary function tests. I hope you can hear me well. I am in a little bit of a situation here with the echo. I can hear a little bit of an echo here in the basement. I'm sitting in the basement today. And if you have any trouble understanding me or hearing my voice, please let me know. So let's get started. Okay, next slide, please. Where, where are we? So I'll start with the financial disclosures. I have no financial disclosure, disclosures to make. So let's start with a simple and straightforward question. Why shall we ever order PFTs? What's the point of ordering PFTs? And sometimes the simple answer is, well, we want to make the diagnosis. And that's probably the incorrect answer because PFTs really never make the pulmonary diagnosis. PFTs are typically used for something else. So let's see what PFTs are truly used for. First, to identify and quantify changes in pulmonary function. So if in evaluating someone with pulmonary symptoms or perhaps evaluating someone who's completely healthy for screening purposes, we need to understand what their pulmonary function is, quantify their pulmonary function, qu quantify different measures and whether or not those measures are normal values. Usually PFTs give us pattern of disease, not a diagnosis. And you can probably you have probably heard PFTs for this patient show obstructive lung disease or restrictive lung disease or mixed lung disease. So typically that's what PFT reading or PFT interpretation typically says, a pattern of disease and perhaps severity of illness, mild, moderate, severe, very severe. And it almost never gives the full diagnosis. You should never read the PFT report, which says asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera. So first and foremost, PFT does not give us diagnosis, only a pattern of disease. We may need to assess need or effectiveness of the therapy. Let's say someone comes in to a pulmonary clinic with the diagnosis X, let's say COPD, and we start treatment with bronchodilators and steroids. Uh, and whatnot, and three months or six months later, we want to reevaluate whether or not our treatment worked. It would be a good idea to reassess their PFTs and see if their pulmonary function changed based on the treatment of their illness. In other situations, someone may be diagnosed with, let's say, sarcoidosis, and if the patient with sarcoidosis doesn't have significant pulmonary function abnormalities, that patient may not necessarily need treatment. I'm not here to talk about treatment of sarcoidosis, but I'm using that as an example of, I don't want to start the treatment for this patient unless I see the significant pattern of disease, which is reduction in pulmonary function tests. Another possibility is to screen for a pulmonary illness. So some patients will have systemic illness, such as HIV, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, pulmonary hypertension, and you want to screen their pulmonary function tests to make sure that you don't miss when these patients develop pulmonary physiology abnormalities. You want to make sure that at the beginning of their treatment, their pulmonary function is X, and over the course of the treatment, that may or may not change, and you just want to screen so you don't miss the possibility or you don't miss the point where that pulmonary illness starts. Um, another important point or important need, reason for obtaining PFTs is preoperative evaluation for potential complications. Let's say someone comes in and needs surgery for gallbladder, a simple gall, gallbladder removal surgery called a cystectomy. Would you get PFTs to make sure that, that this person does not develop postoperative pulmonary complications? Well, the answer to that question is probably not. So when it comes to preoperative evaluation, PFTs are really only useful in a very small minority of patients, perhaps in patients who are undergoing major thoracic surgery, let's say coronary bypass surgery, or patients that are undergoing lung resection, let's say for lung cancer. So really in those situations and situations perhaps very similar to those, uh, that's the only time when we really need to get preoperative evaluation and make PFTs part of preoperative evaluation. Typically, patients going for routine abdominal and 
extra abdominal surgeries. We're not talking about thoracic surgeries. Let's say surgery on the leg for hip repair or hip replacement, or perhaps vascular surgery on the leg. So patients that are not undergoing significant thoracic surgery or lung resection uh, typically don't need PFTs as part of their preoperative evaluation. And sometimes, and again, relatively rarely, there is need for disability evaluation, and PFTs may be an important part of quantifying someone's disability, especially if that someone has pulmonary disease. So with this in mind, we kind of look at how does PFTs help us make the proper diagnosis in our patients. Perhaps another important and perhaps as important question is when not to order PFTs. So in what clinical scenarios are PFTs uh, unreliable or simply unsafe? If we have an unstable patient, obviously someone's on the ventilator, on multiple pressors, in critical condition in the ICU, that's not the time to order PFTs. However, every now and then in very special situations, we may ask uh, our respiratory therapist to perform certain, perhaps very simple and straightforward pulmonary function tests in ICU patients. These are usually patients with neuromuscular disease, such as myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is another neuromuscular disease. And we may want to look at the person's NIF, negative inspiratory force, or their FVC, force vital capacity, to see the respiratory muscle function and respiratory muscle strength. Outside of those scenarios, ICU patients typically don't require PFDs, and it, they're simply not very useful. Uh, if someone has chest or abdominal pain, it's not so much that it's unsafe to perform PFTs for those patients, but they are more likely not to participate well in the PFTs. And I'm sure you already know that PFTs are somewhat, if not totally, effort dependent. So if someone has chest pain or abdominal pain, that person is not going to provide full effort to pulmonary function tests, and perhaps what we're going to be left with somewhat unreliable or difficult to interpret data. Recent surgery, again, for similar reasons, if you had a knee replacement or a hip replacement surgery, perhaps that should not affect pulmonary function tests. But if, you, if the patient had abdominal or thoracic surgery, even eye surgery, that may not be the best time to perform pulmonary function tests. For chest abdominal surgery, uh, I, I hope that the uh, reasons are obvious as to why not to perform PFTs. The patients who have had eye, recent eye surgery done it may not be as straightforward, but uh, performance of pulmonary function tests often involves and includes taking a deep breath and blowing it, it out under significant pressure. That, that, may, that pressure may actually damage a very fragile wound that the patient may have on their eyes. So recent eye surgery is typically a contraindication to performing PFTs. Nausea, vomiting may be another contraindication because these patients will be prone to aspirate. So if someone has significant nausea and vomiting, that, again, may not be the best time to do PFTs. We already talked about acutely and critically ill patients. And the other one is if the person is unable to follow detailed commands. Uh, some individuals, young individuals that may not be able to simply follow the detailed commands, um, uh, the pulmonary function tests typically are not performed in uh, uh, children under three or four years of age simply because they can't really perform PFTs very well, although some measurements can still be obtained even uh, on newborns. But alternatively, if someone has dementia or some kind of a mental reason as to why they could not participate in detailed um, commands and following detailed commands, you would expect that that person would not give a valid and reliable results on the PFTs. So again, think twice before ordering it on someone who's severely demented or has some other type of uh, mental retardation or otherwise. So what can we get from PFTs? Let's say we did the PFTs and now we have the results in our hands. What are the important things to look for on the PFTs? So we can get what's called conventional PFTs, things like spirometry, lung volumes, DLCO. We can get some additional tests such as bronchodilator challenge, methacholine ch challenge, MIPs, MEPs, um, 
and then talk about cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPT when we do exercise oximetry or six minute walk test. And at the end, there's also arterial blood gases and some people put arterial blood gases, especially in the outpatient PFT laboratory, arterial blood gases can be part of the PFTs. Today, I'm mostly gonna concentrate on things such as conventional PFTs, things like spirometry, lung volumes, and DLCO. I wanna make sure I have a little pointer here. Pardon me. I was trying to point with my mouse and I'm, I've done something terrible. I'm, it's transcribing my speech. There we go. So today we'll be talking about mostly conventional PFTs, such, things such as spirometry, lung volumes, and DLCO, and I'll, I'll only briefly mention bronchodilator challenge and methacholine challenge in today's discussion. Next, perhaps as important question is, what shall I read? And what that question really addresses is uh, first and foremost, uh, looking at the reliability of the data. So here I have a piece of paper that has a whole bunch of numbers in front of me. Before I start looking into what's the value of FEV1 or what's the value of FBC, more, more importantly than that, to me, the first step is look at, at the values and graphs and all the data as a whole and understanding and accepting that this is the PFTs, this is data that's worth reading. So one of my pet peeves is GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So if the test is unreliable, if I can't be sure that the FEV1 and FVC and DLCO and TLC and all those other variables are reliable variables, then I'm not going to read them. I'm going to say it's not worth putting these values in perspective be because the, the values are not reliable. So first and foremost, look at the data and make sure that the data is acceptable and readable. We're going to obviously look for normal versus abnormal. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, especially since most of the guidelines now are pushing the envelope in terms of what's normal and what's abnormal. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that, and hopefully we don't get too philosophical when discussing what's considered normal versus abnormal these days. Then you want to look for a pattern of abnormality. So, so again, does this person have a pattern of obstructive or restrictive lung disease? Perhaps there is a mixture, mixed picture of obstruction and restriction. What's the severity of the disease? Let's assume that it's an obstructive disease. How severe is it? Is it mild? moderate, severe, very severe. And then perhaps look for some clues for clinical diagnosis. Once again, PFTs cannot provide us with clinical diagnosis, but if you have someone who's elderly, has a significant smoking history, and now has obstructive pattern on the pulmonary function tests, that's pretty likely to be COPD and not pulmonary fibrosis. Here's schematic representation of various pulmonary function values. And you'll see that some of them are called capacities and some, are, some of them are called volumes. And this is sort of the old nomenclature, but some of the names have stuck. I'm gonna spend just a minute, I'm assuming that most of you know these values very well, and we don't have to get into details of what RV or vital capacities, et cetera. I'll just mention it for the completeness sake. So. First, we have residual volume, which is the volume of air that's always inside the lungs. We can never exhale this amount of air. That's residual volume. And it's very important that we have residual volume because it would be very difficult to completely deflate lungs with each breath. And then at the beginning of the next breath, completely inflate them again. The difference between RV and ERV, or rather sum of RV and ERV brings us to FRC. So this value from the bottom to about here is the FRC, which is functional residual volume. This is the amount of volume that we have, or functional residual, I'm sorry, functional residual capacity. This is the amount of volume that we have in our lungs at the end of normal exhalation. And some people consider this, actually by convention, this is considered the resting volume. So when the lung is at complete rest, it's at functional residual capacity. So the end of normal respiration, end of normal tidal volume, 
it's exhal end of exhalation. The lung is at rest, lung is at FRC. The difference between FRC and RV is over here between this point and this point, and that represents ERV. I hope you see my little red dot that I'm using as a pointer. Please let me know if you don't. So the difference between FRC and RV is ERV or expiratory reserve volume. Then we have a tidal volume, which is normal tidal breathing, okay? Next one is inspiratory reserve volume. That's the amount of volume that we can inhale at the end of normal inhalation. So let's say you're breathing in and out, in and out, and you take a breath in, you can imagine that there is still quite a bit of air that you can still inhale. And that amount of air between the end of normal inspiration and the total amount or total lung capacity is inspiratory reserve volume. Then we have obviously total lung capacity, which is the difference between the bottom line and the top line. And perhaps another very important variable, very important measurement here is vital capacity or inspiratory viral capacity. Most of the people just simply call it vital, vital capacity. That's the difference between RV, full exhalation, and TLC, full inhalation. I'm going to use this diagram in the second half of the discussion when we actually uh, try to answer some questions. I have some multiple choice questions. I have some um, um, sample PFT interpretation. So I'm going to come back to this diagram if, um, if needed and as needed to answer some of those questions. So I just included here to uh, briefly go over it and remind ourselves what these different values are. Here's some of the other graphs that you uh, may be used to seeing. And again, different Laboratories will report different types of data, but these are some of the commonly reported data uh, that comes with PFTs. Here on the first graph, we have um, time versus volume as the patient is breathing. And this seems similar to the previous graph that, we, that I showed you. As the patient is breathing, this is normal tidal breathing here, the small waves. And then they take a deep breath and they fully exhale. So obviously the difference between full inhalation up here and full exhalation down here is the vital capacity, or this will be forced vital capacity because person is asked to exhale forcefully. And perhaps another very, very important variable here is FE1 or uh, forced expiratory volume in one second. So how much of the FVC is expressed in the first second of exhalation? And we want this value to be relatively high, relatively large percentage of FE, FVC, about 80% or so. And we're going to come back to that uh, value very often in this discussion today. The next graph down here on the bottom left is perhaps the opposite, the inverted version of this red line. So if you can imagine that this red line being inverted, that's what we have down here. And again, we have FE1. And here we have vital capacity. So what's the difference between vital capacity and forced vital capacity? So the vital capacity that's here is perhaps so-called slow volume, uh, I'm sorry, slow vital capacity. Some people will call slow vital capacity and compare slow vital capacity to forced vital capacity. Now, I, I wanna point your attention to the bottom graph here, which is the x-axis again is time and the y-axis is volume. And pay attention to how much time has elapsed until this person reached the vital capacity, full vital capacity. Over here, we have nine, almost 10 seconds. Over here, we have about two, two and a half seconds. So this is the bottom graph represents relatively slow vital capacity. And it takes this person a long, long time to fully exhale. The person in this graph has relatively brief and quick exhalation and they reach their full vital capacity or FVC or forced vital capacity very quickly. Whereas this individual requires lots and lots of time to get there. The reason for that is that this individual on the bottom here probably has some type of obstructive lung disease that doesn't allow him or her to rapidly exhale. As he rapidly exhales, his airways are closing because of let's say COPD and he's no longer able to have a reasonable force vital capacity. Also, this graph represents the 
importance of reaching plateau. So you see how this vital capacity reaches plateau here. You wanna make sure that the, the vital capacity, if, if we have this type of graph, that the person reaches plateau before the test is terminated. Because if that graph is, continues to go up and up and up, it's quite likely that we missed the vital capacity. We did not let the person fully exhale and the vital capacity that we measured may be very much lower than the true vital capacity that this individual has. The next graph over here on the right is your typical flow volume loop. And I think it's very important for you to be um, comfortable reading and interpreting flow, flow volume loops. I'm gonna have another little session both during the interpretation part and the didactic part uh, looking at flow volume loops. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here other than just quick introduction to flow volume loops. When the top part is exhalation, the bottom part is inhalation. And that's indicated here. You really can't read the FEV1 on the flow volume loop, but this is sort of arbitrary point where the FEV1 would be on this patient. The importance of the flow volume loop is to look at the shapes of both exhal exhalation and inhalation or expiratory and inspiratory part of the loop, and then uh, evaluate the shape and the magnitude. How high does it go? How quickly does it turn down? How big is the volume? Remember, this graph rep represents volume versus flow. So how much is the flow at different volumes? At the larger volumes, we have more flow. At the smaller volumes, we have less flow. You see how this particular part of the expiratory phase of the flow volume loop is relatively straight. And this is not an actual flow volume loop, so they're not always straight like a line, straight like an arrow, but some people would like to examine the concavity of it. So does the flow volume loop come down relatively straight or there is a looping to it or con concavity to it? So does it come down like this, like I'm showing you with my little pointer, or it comes down more like a straight line? So as it becomes more scooped out, that's usually the sign of obstruction. Also pay attention to the bottom part. See if the bottom part is truncated in any way. And that would be the inspiratory part, and the truncated bottom part would be more indicative of perhaps restrictive lung diseases. So a lot of times flow volume loops carried a ton of information, and it's really important for anyone that interprets PFTs to be comfortable with reading, interpreting, uh, and getting information from flow volume loops. Okay. So we, we talked a little bit about troubleshooting. You want to make sure that you have a good expiratory plateau. Uh, you want to make sure that expiration lasted at least six seconds, because if it's less than six seconds, the person may not have fully exhaled, um, and you may be underestimating their vital capacity. Uh, back extrapolation is adequate. There is no cough interference. And sometimes uh, you have to rely on your technician who says, well, patient was coughing a lot or patient didn't give a good effort. And sometimes you have to get that by looking at the flow volume loops because the numbers, the actual values or FEV1 and FVC and TLC may not give you the full picture of whether or not the patient coughed or whether or not the patient gave a good effort. Sometimes we do a number of spirometry maneuvers to try to pick the best one of them, and you can do up to eight. And, and then you report best FEV1 and best FPC, even though they may not necessarily come from the same maneuver. So let's say we do eight maneuvers, and the best FEV1 was maneuver number two, and best FPC was maneuver number seven. That, those are the values that you're going to re report and not the maneuver number two or maneuver number seven. Um, and then technician must evaluate poor, uh, I'm sorry, must evaluate and report poor patient effort. I had a little typo there. Technician must evaluate and report poor patient effort. So a lot of times when we're interpreting the data, we're not there when the data was obtained. So if there's a problem with the data, if the technician recognizes that the patient coughed, that shouldn't be too difficult to recognize, or if the technician realized that the patient did not give a full effort, that should be well documented. So the person interpreting the, the data, interpreting the values, will take that into account during their interpretation. Uh, what about the reference values? 
So where do we get the reference values to say that the um, the patient's particular values of FEV1 and FVC and TLC are normal or abnormal? Typically, normal PFT values depend on the characteristics of the individual. Height, perhaps the most important one. So lungs grow as we grow taller. Lungs typically don't grow as we, we grow wider. So it's not so much the weight dependent as it is the height dependent. Age, obviously younger individuals have higher pulmonary function um, and typically pulmonary function uh, reaches its maximum, its apex around age 20 to 25 and starts to slowly decline from there. So you can imagine that 80 year old person probably would not have the same pulmonary function test that the 20 year old person would. Gender, and this has to be a biological gender. Again, men typically have higher values for their pulmonary function tests for a given height and age. So if someone had a sex change operation, that should probably be considered as their biological uh, sex and not the assigned sex at a later time. Uh, this was actually part of the discussion at, in one of the articles that I'm quoting towards the end for your read, as your reading material. Uh, and then race and, and ethnicity also plays a role, perhaps a minor role, uh, but uh, individuals of different ethnicities will have different expected values for uh, various pulmonary function tests. Their uh, refer reference values are widely available. Uh, I'm sure you can get it on the internet. There are multiple articles that publish these values, and they also publish the formulas how to derive these values. And these are now typically done by the computer, so individual technicians or physicians like myself interpreting the test don't actually have to look up these values because these are all computerized and reported by the computer and calculated by the computer. So here we come to perhaps one of my favorite uh, points of the discussion about normally abnormal or abnormally normal pulmonary function tests. So what defines uh, test being abnormal? And you can say, what's the normal height or no, uh, abnormal height? And uh, we have individuals there, they live perfectly healthy life and uh, they're seven feet tall and um, three feet tall. They, both of these individuals can have long and uh, successful lives. So pulmonary function tests, similarly, what, the, what does it depend on and what defines that someone's pulmonary function tests are too low or too high? Well, we do have some uh, population-based data to say that great majority of the individuals that we test will test within this range. But then we, even within that range, we have to talk about the possibility that there's always overlap between healthy and diseased individuals. So yes, the value of FEV1 over FVC, which is commonly used for the diagnosis of obstruction, typically falls somewhere in this range, and you can see that this range can have healthy individuals and diseased individuals as well. And then where you draw the line in terms of what the, no what the normal value of FEV1 over FEC should be will determine whether or not you're gonna have a whole bunch of false positive or whole false negative tests. So if we bring this FEV1 over FEC value over here and say, I don't want anyone that's healthy to be uh, labeled as diseased, then we're going to miss a whole bunch of individuals that have the disease to the right of that point. There are a whole bunch of individuals that have the disease, but they have so-called normal pulmonary function tests. Whereas if you bring it all the way to the right over here and say, I don't want to miss anyone that has the disease, now you're labeling a lot of healthy individuals with disease. So where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line in the sand and say, FEV1 over FVC of this value is abnormal, period, end of story. Well, unfortunately, in today's day and age, we have two major um, guidelines, two major societies. Uh, I wouldn't say feuding but, uh, about this, but giving um, sort of conflicting uh, opinions as to where the normal value of FEV1 over FVC should be. The ATS, American Thoracic Society, and ERJ, European uh, uh, ERS, I'm sorry, uh, European Respiratory Society, think that the FEV1 over FVC 
abnormal should be below fifth percentile. So if you fall, if your FEV1, FBC falls below fifth percentile value, that's when you're abnormal. The gold or, uh, criteria or gold initiative for COPD believes that that value should be FEV1 over FBC of 0 0.7 or less. And you'll notice that historically, the abnormal value for FEV1 over FBC ratio has been defined as it being less than 0 0.7. And nowadays, since 2005, two major societies, ATS and ERS, two major societies are strongly pushing for moving that target down to the fifth percentile value. And obviously, for fifth percentile value is going to be different from 20-year-olds compared to the 80-year-olds. So here's here I have uh, a wonderful graph given in the, one of the articles that I have referenced to by uh, Sanya Stojanovic, and this is supported by ATS and ERS guidelines. And here we have males in sort of this darker blue. I hope you can appreciate the difference between these colors on your screen. It, it's kind of difficult to see them on my screen, but this is how they were in the article when I copied this graph from. So we have the difference between males in, uh, in uh, darker blue and females in lighter blue. And then we have a fifth percentile line as dotted for both males, again, in the darker blue and females in the lighter blue. And based on these lines, this is where all the various people fall under, where, where the average values fall under when you start at the age 20, all the way up to age 100 or so. So this shows you also the, the point where most of the people, including myself, historically, have considered FEV1 over FBC of 0 0.7 as abnormal value. And you see that for individuals age about 40 or so, for both ATS and gold criteria, or historic criteria, I should call them. So both new ATS criteria and old historic criteria for uh, abnormal FEV1 over FVC are the same at the age of 40. The same value of less than FEV1 over FBC being more than 70 as you're younger will be considered, considered abnormal by the newer criteria. And similarly, the same number will be considered normal over here if you're disease, uh, I'm sorry, if you're elder. So what's the interpretation of this big and perhaps confusing slide? The new versus old definition of abnormal value for FEV1 over FVC. There's minutia, dif minutia differences between them. And typically those differences are the following. If you're younger, you're, you're more likely to be considered as abnormal by the newer criteria. And if you're older, you're more likely to be considered abnormal by the old criteria, histo historic criteria. And if you're 42 or so years old, they're both exactly the same. So the next question is, how big are these differences? And I'm going to skip the Z score. Uh, to me, this is an even deeper dive into, into statistics and philosophical discussion. And I'm going to skip this one. And I really want to show you this next slide here. So the FEV1 over FVC values or the fifth percentile values. Here they are for FEV1 over FVC. And they're not very different from the value of 0 0.7. So the big difference between the new criteria and old criteria, there is no big difference. The majority of the patients should be properly classified as healthy or diseased based on either new or old criteria. Only people at the verge of illness just below or just above the normal values may be misclassified by the new versus old criteria, but by and large, great proportion of the individuals that are undergoing PFTs will get the same reading based on the new versus old criteria. There are multiple other studies, uh, also population-based studies that examine thousands upon thousands of PFTs, 
and have come up with a similar data that somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of the individuals undergoing PFTs will be properly classified or classified the same way both by new and old criteria and we're really talking about small percentage of patients that will be misclassified and those people are usually at the extremes of age either very old or very young so that's where the majority of the differences between the two, two new and old criteria have um, perhaps i already spent too much time on this but you may see ats and ers really strongly pushing for the new criteria where most of us are still very much comfortable with the old criteria with FEV1 over FVC being less than 0 0.7 period, no percentile values needed. And for the most part, when we interpret studies today, I'm going to give you those values and not percentile values. So back to more basic discussion about PFTs. Most of the PFTs will be broken down into sort of basic evaluation, things like FEV1, vital capacity, which is usually forced vital capacity, FEV1 over VC or FEV1 over FVC, TLC, RV over TLC, ERV, which is expiratory reserve volume, uh, DLCO, and then flow volume. And some additional tests to look for bronchoprovocation, bronchodilator response, FEF 2575, which by the way, the importance of FEF 2575 has been greatly disemphasized, de-emphasized. So nobody really should look at 20, FEF 2575 and a few other things that um, I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on today because I want to stay uh, within the framework of basic PFT evaluation. So what can we get in terms of patterns of disease when evaluating someone uh, that only had spirometry? So we can see normal values. Everything looks normal. That's pretty easy. Obstructive typically is characterized by FVC over, uh, I'm sorry, FEV1 over FVC being low. Uh, and FVC in this situation is typically normal or it could be low by itself. So you shouldn't be dissuaded by the fact that FVC is low as long as FEV1 over FVC is low. The, the individual value of FVC being low does not preclude the obstructive lung disease. When we have restrictive lung disease, the typical pattern is FEV1 over FVC being a normal value, and typically FVC is low. And then we have the mixed picture when both of these things are present, FEV1 over FVC is low, and FVC can also be very low. And sometimes these mixed patterns are very difficult to properly interpret on spirometry, and we need um, lung volumes for that. So here's another table form, again, taken from the article by Stojanovic uh, et al. And this table is um, sort of quickly showing you the different patterns of obstructive versus restrictive versus mixed disorders. Uh, sometimes you can tell the muscle weakness of, or suboptimal effort by looking at the flow volume loop and lack of sharp peak expiratory flow. Unfortunately, you can't make this uh, final determination just for, on spirometry only, but you can suspect either muscle weakness or suboptimal effort looking at the, uh, looking at the flow volume loop and the shape of the flow volume loop. Here it is, basically the same discussion, same algorithm or, or same approach in the algorithm form, I should say. And here, since this is taken from the um, article that was published in ATS and supported by ATS and ERS guidelines, here they're talking about the fifth percentile value. So is FEV1 over FVC less than fifth percentile value rather than looking at the fixed value of 0 0.7? So if FEV1 over FVC is reduced, then we, uh, I'm sorry, if FEV1 over FVC is reduced, we're looking on the right here. I, I went the wrong direction. Right, so uh, the the ratio is reduced. Then we look at the FVC percentile, FVC individually. If that's normal, we have airflow obstruction. If FVC is low, we still have obstructive disorder, but we may also have restrictive disorder. And like I said, we need to go to the lung volumes to evaluate. On the other hand, if FEV1 over FVC is greater than fifth percentile, then again we look at the FVC value. 
if FVC is also normal, we have normal spirometry. If FVC is reduced, we may have a restrictive pattern or not specific pattern, and we need to go to the long volumes to determine what's going on. So this is pretty simple and straightforward approach to interpreting spirometry. Here's flow volume loop, and perhaps uh, it's worthwhile spending a couple of minutes on flow volume loop to make sure that we're comfortable uh, looking at it and reading different values on the flow volume loop. Um, we already talked about the, the straight line here and concavity of it. And here again, it's this is relatively straight and looks pretty good. And then inspiratory, inspiratory loop of the flow volume loop or inspiratory part of the flow volume loop also looks like um, nice and big. Kind of reminds me of an iceberg, if you will. So here's some simple, uh, perhaps drawings of what normal and abnormal should look like. So here we have normal uh, flow volume loop. Here's a notched expiration. And this typically happens during expiration. If we have a notched expiration, that typically means some kind of cough or interference with expiration. Here we have a nice start to exhalation and then kind of abrupt end. And this may be due to glottis, uh, sort of um, immature glottis closure. So somebody for some reason stopped exhaling, uh, perhaps um, intentionally or not intentionally. And this would be a good sign that perhaps this was not a very good or very reliable test. Here we have the absence of a nice peak flow. Remember how most of the normal flow volume loops have this sort of peak, iceberg or mountain peak, if you will. And here we don't have the mountain peak at all. It's more like a hill. And that's typically the sign of suboptimal effort. This may also be the sign of um, neuromuscular weakness or neuromuscular disease. Here's another one, hesitation at start. So perhaps someone that was improperly coached on how to breathe, how to perform PFTs, or someone that didn't know exactly what to do. And if you're a technician reading or um, obtaining this kind of flow volume loop, you need to recognize that this is uh, not a very good data. So perhaps we should repeat uh, the spirometry, repeat the flow volume loop to make sure that we have more reliable results. Um, here's um, normal flow volume loop, and I'm gonna show you some abnormal flow volume loops to come and perhaps discuss some of the differences, what they look like and uh, what they really represent. Um, here is some obstruction and obstruction. Uh, I'm gonna show you the normal values on the left. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, make it uh, quite clear. So for the next few slides, we're gonna have some abnormal flow volume loops and I'm gonna superimpose those next to the normal ones. So we're gonna have normal ones on the left and the abnormal will be on the right and we'll do a quick comparison of uh, what's abnormal and what's different. Even though the shape looks the same, you see how the inspiratory loop here, for example, comes down all the way to the eight liters and the inspiratory loop here barely comes down to the four liters, right? And the same here for the expiratory loop. So this is not just a miniature version of this. And this is not because I made the scale different. This is truly the person didn't have inspiratory and expiratory values as normal as the one on the left did. So here we have um, obstructive lung disease evidenced by concavity or scooped out shape of the flow volume loop. So this is relatively straight here, and this is kind of scooped out over here. Next one is also obstructive lung disease, although this is even more severe than the previous one I showed you. Again, very scooped out expiratory loop and inspiratory loop is even more truncated. But pay attention to the fact that we still have this little bit of a peak. We're gonna see in a minute, we're gonna see the flow volume loop that's truncated both on expiratory and inspiratory loops. And that's also a very specific finding but let's do a quick comparison between this one on the right, again, abnormal, left is gonna be always normal. And this one, this one's even more reduced than the other one was. So this is severe obstructive lung disease. The previous one was more mild or moderate obstructive lung disease. 
you can't really judge the severity of it very accurately based on these uh, flow volume loops, but you can see that this flow volume loop looks a lot worse than this flow volume loop in terms of values and in terms of how scooped out it is. Next one here is a little bit abnormal. The, the expiratory part looks pretty good. The inspiratory part looks a little bit kind of raggedy. So this one is um, variable obstruction, variable extraterrestrial obstruction. Here's my favorite. Anybody hungry in the audience? This is a so-called pancaking or flattening of the flow volume loop, both inspiratory here on the bottom and expiratory phases or expiratory portion of the flow volume loop are truncated. And more importantly, there is really no peak, no peak like iceberg or like a big mountain, like Mount Everest. We don't have a peak at all. And the bottom also looks kind of flat. So complete flattening or pancaking, a lot of people call it a pancaking, of flow volume loop should be indicative of fixed airway obstruction, something like airway, um, something like stenosis, uh, like tracheal stenosis, for example. Here's another good one. It's kind of difficult to read this one based on flow volume loop, but see how abnormal this is, this uh, inspiratory loop is. Uh, this could be due to um, unilateral um, bronchial obstruction. So it, it, it can get pretty fancy reading some of these abnormalities on the flow volume loops, but I think it's important that in general we understand uh, that looking at the flow volume loops can give you some clues to diagnosis or clues to interpretation of pulmonary function tests, and perhaps they can also give you some clues to validity of the test, whether or not a good test was obtained. I'm going to skip this one. We uh, largely discussed this one already. Okay. So what about the lung volumes? Now, moving on from spirometry, the next step being lung volumes. And there are different ways to obtain lung volumes. And I'm going to talk about helium method here for a minute, and then body platysmography, and quickly comparing the two. Uh, looks like we're kind of coming up close on the hour. I may use a little bit of the time to just finish up these uh, slides. And then uh, perhaps we take a break at 4.15 or so. And then we do the interpretation after that, kind of practicing and interpreting the test after that. We'll see how the timing uh, allow us to do that. So let's look, talk about lung volumes. So here we have a, a schematic representation of helium dilution. So here, individual starts being by being connected to a chamber that has a certain amount of helium in it. And he or she breathes through this system. And at the end, there is equilibrium be between this person's lungs and the volume of helium here. So you see uh, there is some difference between the concentration of helium at the beginning of the test and at the end of the test, represented by uh, intensity of these little dots. So you see that the, there are fewer dots on this side than there are on this side, simply because this helium got diluted by the person's lung. So by knowing the volume and the concentration of the helium chamber here at the beginning of the test, knowing the concentration of helium at the end of the test, you can use simple mathematical formulas and derive the volume of the person's lungs. Great, very easy test, um, widely available test, probably doesn't take very long to obtain. It's not dependent on the patient effort. However, you can imagine that if this person has bullae, bullous disease, that's not participating gas exchange, it's not communicating with the rest of the lungs, this person may have barrel chest and would never be picked up on the helium dilution because the part of the chest that makes it barrel chest does not really communicate uh, with the rest of the airway and is not mixed in uh, with the helium dilution. So in patients in whom COPD or bullous disease is suspected, the helium dilution method may underestimate FRC, it actually measures FRC, may underestimate FRC and therefore may underestimate many other values, perhaps most importantly, RV residual volume. So what we do in those situations, in these situations, we obtain body platysmography. 
Now, this is a little bit more sophisticated test. Some people call it a body box because you do go in a box. The person goes into airtight box and then breathes in this airtight box. A whole bunch of volumes uh, and values are obtained and that those values uh, help us interpret um, or rather estimate uh, pulmonary volume, lung volume by using Boyle's Law. I'm sure you had your uh, lessons in physics and you've forgotten all about Boyle's Law. I have too. That's not the important part. The important part is that this way we can actually measure total lung volume rather than measuring the lung volume of only the lung that participates in gas exchange. And in patients with COPD, body plate tomography may be more accurate than a simpler and easier helium dilution test. Unfortunately, body plate tomography takes more time, more effort, and a lot more equipment, especially in terms of that box where the person has to go, the airtight box where the person has to go. So it's not as widely available as helium dilution method is. And here's a similar uh, table in uh, helping to interpret lung volumes and uh, what those lung volumes mean in terms of um, pulmonary function test interpretation. Uh, this one is uh, perhaps a little more complex and a little more complicated algorithm, but it's basically the same approach. We start with TLC. Is the TLC normal or abnormal? Is the TLC below 5th percentile? If the answer is yes, then we're typically dealing with restriction, all right? And the next one we have to assess is RV over TLC. Is RV over TLC very elevated, greater than 95th percentile? If that's the case, we have mixed disorder because RV over TLC is typically, um, or increase RV over, over TLC is typically sign of obstruction, typically sign of air trapping, hyperinflation, and that's the sign of COPD. If the RV over TLC is very elevated, then we're dealing with the mixed disorder. If the RV over TLC is normal, we have simple restriction. And similarly, on the, on the other hand, if TLC is uh, greater than fifth percentile, but also greater than 95th percentile, we either have a case of a Superman or perha perhaps it's someone like Shaquille O'Neal, who's seven feet tall and has uh, lungs as big as a whale. Or perhaps it's more of a case of a hyperinflation based on the fact that RV over TLC uh, is uh, greater than 95th percentile. Kind of the end of the long volume discussion, if you will, the DLCO puzzle. And um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about how the DLCO is measured and also what the DLCO really represents, because it could be somewhat confusing. DLCO to me is a very straightforward assessment, but a lot of times people are adjusting the actual DLC va DLCO values for a whole bunch of other values. And I'm not sure that that's always a good idea to do. Uh, I want to spend, like I said, a couple of minutes on understanding DLCO, how it's measured, what it is actually measuring, and perhaps that will help us um, read and interpret DLCO better. So here, individual inhales a mixture of helium, 10% helium or so, and carbon monoxide, a very, very low concentration of carbon monoxide. This is no way toxic to anyone. Uh, so carbon uh, Monoxide is used here because it crosses the lung blood barrier or alveolar barrier very, very easily and easily picked up by circulation. So that's why we're using CO here. But the values of CO are very, very low. And the helium is added because it's important to measure not just the CO absorption, how much CO we take in or how much CO the person takes in. It's important to to measure that, but it's also important to measure that person's lung volume, because if the individual takes a small breath, then the amount of CO being uptaken is also going to be relatively small. If, on the other hand, the person takes a, a larger breath, then the larger amount of CO, to, CO will be transferred into his circulation. This is to say that a smaller lung volume, if someone has, let's say, restrictive lung disease and is unable to take a full four-liter breath, are we going to measure that person's DLCO based on the smaller two-liter breath or larger four-liter breath? 
as expected. So, so that's what the helium there does. It basically measures, it basically measures the uh, amount of the breath that someone took. The other part of the CO puzzle is the following. As the CO crosses the barrier between alveoli and the circulation, uh, it encounters a couple of other points that may be important in understanding the lung disease. So you can imagine that, that, that if the thickness of the lung is increased, such as in pulmonary fibrosis, less amount of CO will cross over. If the thickness is normal, in which case normal lung thickness of the blood air barrier is very, very small, this is very, very thin, then more CO will cross over. And on this diagram, we're using the example of CO2, but it's the same thing for CO. As the thickness of the lung increases, less CO is transferred across. The other very, very important part is what happens to the CO on the other side. So here we have CO on the alveolar side. Here we have CO on the circulation side. What happens to CO as it crosses into the circulation? Typically, CO is taken up by hemoglobin. Carbon monoxide has very high affinity for hemoglobin and is immediately picked up by the bloodstream. So every single molecule of CO that gets across the, the alveolar to arterial barrier is taken up by the circulation. So in cases where there is hyperemia, in cases where there's a lot of blood on the other side, you can imagine that a lot more CO is being absorbed because of that reason. So if someone has high cardiac output, if someone has, let's say, pulmonary hemorrhage bleeding into their lungs, more CO will be absorbed simply because more hemoglobin is available. And that could be one of the abnormal signs too. So at the end, DLCO depends on, this, depends on the size of the breath, area of the capillary bed, thickness of the capillary basement uh, membrane, and blood's affinity to CO2 and blood's ability to pick up CO2. I'm sorry, CO. I keep saying CO2. All right. So how does DLCO help us in making diagnosis and interpreting PFTs? Normal DLCO is typically in patients with asthma or chronic bronchitis obese individuals, and individuals with neuromuscular and chest wall diseases. You can imagine that if someone has neuromuscular disease, the lung parenchyma itself is relatively normal. So the exchange of CO or transfer of CO, carbon monoxide, from air to the circulation will be relatively normal in individuals with neuromuscular disease. In order for DLCO to be reduced, you actually need to have some type of parenchymal disease, parenchymal disruption thickening of the basement membrane, or perhaps destruction of pulmonary capillary bed. So what are those? Emphysema is a good, representat good representation of decreased DLCO in patients with obstructive lung disease. ILD, something like pulmonary fibrosis, is another one for restrictive lung diseases. And then pulmonary vascular diseases like pulmonary hypertension can also give us a decrease in DLCO. So some patients with early pulmonary hypertension may have normal lung volumes because the lung parenchyma itself is not yet affected. But these individuals will often have reduced DLCO because of the reduction in the pulmonary capillary bed. Some patients with pulmonary embolism may also have reduction in their DLCO for the same reason. On the other hand, some individuals may have increased DLCO, and that's typically in cases of pulmonary hemorrhage or very mild heart failure. Some patients with mild heart failure can actually have increased cardiac output, and that, that provides an increased number of cells coming up, increased number of red cells, I should say, coming up to pick up CO, and that can, increase, uh, that can lead to increased DLCO as well. So the algorithm for DLCO uh, interpretation is relatively small. Is it normal, greater than, uh, fifth percentile, is it abnormal? If it's abnormally high, we have one of these situations. We discussed most of those already. If it's abnormally low, below fifth percentile, then we have to look at VA. Did the person take a deep breath? If the patient didn't take a deep breath, then it's something else. If, if, if the person took a normal 
deep breath, so VA, alveolar ventilation was normal. We're dealing with pulmonary vascular abnormality, something like pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension. We may have emphysema with preserved lung volume or anemia. If both VA, which is alveolar ventilation, and DLCO is low, we may have loss of alveolar capillary structure or, or lo localized loss of lung volume. There's this concept of KCO, and that's another kind of deep discussion, one of my pet peeves, the difference between KCO and DLCO. And uh, I think the DLCO can be very confusing in and of itself, and I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on the differences between DLCO and KCO here, because again, I want to sort of concentrate on the basics of the PFT interpretation. So by and large, DLCO, think about increased DLCO, increased blood flow to the pulmonary vasculature, alveolar hemorrhage, or when the DLCO is decreased um, with normal lung volumes, this is usually pulmonary, um, pulmonary vascular disease or reduced lung volumes. That's typically something like pulmonary fibrosis or destruction of the pulmonary parenchyma. Here's a very, very big and complex algorithm. And in many situations, I don't like this algorithm and going through this algorithm can be relatively difficult. And perhaps this is more for the final interpretation and kind of putting everything together uh, in terms of PFTs and making the diagnosis. But a lot of times um, the supporting supportive evidence uh, in terms of a patient's history and physical findings and supporting data can be similarly very, very helpful in making the diagnosis. Uh, this is uh, taken from the one of the articles published in the European Respiratory Journal in 2005. There are actually five big articles published. And towards the end of this slide set, I will have that reference for you. And if you're interested in uh, taking a deep dive into pulmonary function tests, uh, that will, those five articles will be very, very interesting and very, very important, or perhaps more superficial and by no means superficial, just compared to the other five articles. But very, very good discussion is another article that was published last year by Stanovich et al., and that will also be at the end um, in the references section. So if you're interested, I would refer you to read that if you're interested in uh, reading this algorithm, perhaps uh, reading through those articles uh, will be beneficial because sometimes uh, even I get confused in these algorithms myself and I don't want to get um, sort of bogged down in this rather difficult um, scheme here. I think we're coming towards the end of this discussion and I just want to say a couple of words on the severity assessment. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned before, based on uh, the pulmonary function test, we can not only pinpoint the type of pulmonary abnormality, but also quantify the extent of the pulmonary abnormality. And typically, the severity assessment is made by FEV1. How reduced is FEV1? So even if we're dealing with restrictive lung diseases where FEV1 is not a prominent feature of pulmonary function tests, we still use FEV1 as the measure or tool of severity assessment. So here's some simple uh, ranges for mild. It's usually FEV1 greater than 70%. For moderate, 60 to 69% predicted. For moderately severe, 50 to 60%. And then we have severe and very severe categories. And for DLCO, those numbers are slightly different um, because how DLCO is obtained in general. Okay. A couple of words on bronchoprovocation and then um, um, bronchodilator challenge. And like I said, we'll probably finish around 4.15 or so, and we we'll, should have plenty of time to talk about sample PFT interpretation. Um, indications for bron bronchoprovocation is when the history and physical is not is suggestive of asthma, but not fully diagnostic of asthma, and PFTs don't support that diagnosis either. So there's some contraindications in performing bronchoprovocation test. About 20 years ago, uh, when I was still a young physician, there was uh, a, a major, a major news story and a big deal about young individual dying at John Hopkins Hospital um, during the bronchoprovocation test, and that brought up a lot of safety issues with bronchoprovocation test. Uh, but that's again more historical uh, point than anything else. So we have some contraindications to perform bronchoprovocation if someone has very severe disease. You don't want to provoke and and. Uh, sort of trigger their exacerbation. 
So severe airflow obstruction will be a contraindication, a myocardial infarction of stroke within three months, uncontrolled blood pressure, uh, and uh, patient's poor effort during uh, spirometry will be a major absolute contraindication to performing bronchoprovocation test. And then we have some relative contraindications, such as moderate high airflow obstruction, uh, pregnant uh, mother or nursing mother, or, or perhaps myasthenia gravis or other types of neuromuscular diseases. Here's the typical bronchoprovocation test. You basically challenge the individual with increasing doses. Here we have methacholine as an example of pro bronchoprovocator, and we challenge the individual with incremental doses uh, and the concentrations of methacholine, and we record the point, or the dosage rather, at which the FEV1 drops 20% below baseline. So different individuals will have different points. I'm sure everyone has some kind of trigger point at which their FEV1 will drop below 20% uh, below the initial measure, uh, but we typically don't go much above the values that are obtained here. And then in terms of reporting, PC20 is reported, which means uh, that the concentration that caused 20% drop in FE1 is reported. There are some diseases that can give us false positives, CHF, COPD, rhinitis, sarcoidosis, all of these diseases can give us false positive results, so we have to be careful with those. And then a couple of words on bronchodilator response. And perhaps the most important question is, does it really matter what the bronchodilator response and uh, the values of the bronchodilator response are? And to some academic individual, this may be important to show that FEV1 or FVC did or did not increase with bronchodilator. To me, I take this, uh, I take it, take a more of a practical approach to this question. Does the patient feel better after bronchodilator? If the answer is yes, I typically prescribe bronchodilator. If the patient tells me that he or she did not feel better after bronchodilator, I, I may be hard pressed to prescribe it, but maybe with the significant increase in the pulmonary function tests, uh, I can uh, persuade them to take the bronchodilator. Um, to me, again, practically speaking, the amount of change between pre and post bronchodilator measurement is not as important as the patient's symptoms um, or report that bronchodilators do or do not help with their disease symptoms. And here's a uh, sort of the long story about how ATS and ERS view this uh, point, uh, and they talk about um, the exact sequence of events, how to administer bronchodilator challenge or bro how to measure bronchodilator response. And perhaps one thing to remember is that we are looking for increase in FEV1 and or FVC. So either FEV1 or FVC greater than 12% of control and greater than 200 ml. So in order for the bronchodilator challenge to be positive, or patient to have bronchodilator response, either FEV1 value or FVC value has to increase more than 12% and more than 200 mLs. I'm gonna skip the RVC or RV over TLC and MIP and MAP values. They're typically not very important and not terribly valuable tests. And I'm going to get to the summary because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to, uh, to finish up, answer some of your questions, and then go through some sample PFT interpretation. So in summary, uh, when, when uh, facing the PFTs, when you're facing the data to interpret PFTs, first evaluate the quality of the test, look at the technician's report, did the patient give good effort, uh, look at the flow volume loop and uh, assess, in general, assess the test and decide for yourself whether or not this is a good, reliable test. Quickly scan for abnormal values. Where's the abnormal value? If everything is normal, that's probably very easy to interpret. If the abnormal value is, in, is more in the FEV1 range, then look for FEV1 over FVC ratio. If it's reduced, typically obstruction. Check RV over TLC to confirm. Check flow volume loop, flow volume loop to look for additional problems. 
If the majority of abnormalities are in the TLC range, then look at the TLC. And when it's reduced, it's usually a sign of restriction. As far as the DLC goes, reduced DLC typically means destruction of the pulmonary parenchyma or destruction of the capillary bed. So use DLCO and measurement of DLCO to differentiate between, let's say, COPD and chronic bronchitis or COPD and asthma. Patients with COPD will typically have reduced DLCO and patients with asthma will typically have preserved DLCO. And chronic bronchitis typically mimics asthma in that regard. And then finally, take your PFT interpretation, take your obstructive versus restrictive versus mixed disease, DLCO, elevated, not, and put that in perspective with patient symptoms and other findings. So if you have someone who's elderly and smoker and has obstructive disease, that's going to be pretty simple and straightforward to say that that's consistent with uh, COPD. If on the other hand, you have someone with restrictive lung disease, and um, perhaps evidence of pulmonary fibrosis on the CAT scan, that's going to be a pretty good diagnostic test that this patient is probably suffering from some type of pulmonary fibrosis. So that's kind of my last words in terms of summary. And um, I want to take a brief break. Uh, we'll have Terry and I'll decide whether it's going to be five or 10 minute break. And then uh, I have um, uh, a handful, perhaps a dozen uh, multiple choice questions on PFTs and another half a dozen or so um, actual PFTs to review and, and see if we can interpret them. Um, I thank you for your attention and I'll take some questions and we take as we take, let's say 10 minute break. How's that, Al? All right, so now we're starting with um, sort of a practice, practice section and uh, going through some questions some of them, I pulled them down from, from the website, and I'll show you which website that is. And I'm not sure how, how popular that website is for you guys, but I thought of getting some, some simple questions on uh, PFTs. And I got them off the website, and now the slides are not advancing, and hopefully we get... Okay, I apologize for some reason. My slides are not moving forward. Here we go. So some warm-up, some layup questions, if you will. Which of the following is equal to RV? And this is on the bottom here in red, I have the reference to that website where I pulled down these questions from. Kind of warm up, remember what these different values are. And if you don't remember, here's that um, diagram that we talked about earlier. Let's use the diagram to figure out which one of these values will be equal to uh, res uh, residual volume. And hopefully you all gave the correct answer of TLC minus VC. That's your residual volume. Okay, for the next question, I'm gonna take a little bit of a pause. So I'm gonna stay here to allow everyone to kind of think about and um, you can't give an answer in the chat. You can if you want to, but at least uh, kind of write it down or take a mental note for yourself. Um, what would you answer? And then I'll give you my, my correct answer, at least the way I understand it. We can discuss that too if you disagree with my answer. So which one of the following is equal to inspiratory capacity? So what's inspiratory capacity? Where was that on our little diagram? Over here, that's the difference between FRC and TLC. So to me, that would be B, vital capacity minus ERV. Okay. Hopefully you all gave the same answer. So kind of continuation of the same thing. Now we're going to measure some of this, or we have measurements and we have to back calculate. Patient has a vital capacity of 4,200 mLs and FRC of 3,300 mLs and ERV of 1,500 mLs. What's the patient's RV? And you may recognize that one of these values is redundant. We don't really need all three of them. How's that? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. So hopefully this is not a really uh, math exam. It's more understanding the pulmonary physiology and values. So the 
our RV is the difference between FRC and ERV. So FRC is here, minus ERV would give us RV, and that will be 3,300 minus 1,500. The correct answer is D, 1,800. Okay. So bottle capacity is 3,600 mLs, FRC is 2,000 mLs, and RV is 1,000 mL. What is the TLC? More importantly, which one of these values is redundant in our calculation? So, TLC is bottle capacity plus RV. So FRC in this situation is redundant. We just have to add 3,600 plus 1,000. And that gives us the correct answer is C, 4,600 mLs. Let me know if I should slow down and uh, do a little more explanation on these, or should I should give you more time to uh, kind of do your own calculation or figure it out yourself, yourselves if I want to make sure that we go through all these questions, but I also want to make sure that you get a chance to think about these questions and uh, give an answer yourself. At least write it down and see whether or not you were correct. So here we have vital, I'm sorry, tidal volume is 650, ERV is 1100, and RV is 1150. What would FRC be? Slides are not advancing anymore. Okay, here we go. So the answer is FRC is ERV plus RV. So expiratory reserve volume plus residual volume. So that's 1100 plus 1150. So the correct answer is C, 2250. All right, so this is actually my own question that I made up for the medical students that I teach. Uh, so it's no longer from that website that I was quoting before. And this one's a little bit, a um, little bit more involved. And I'm sorry, the answers were supposed to be uh, animated or for some reason, the PowerPoint decided to give the answers too. So cover the bottom of your screen if you want to um, calculate TLC. And then perhaps more importantly, discuss which, if any respiratory disease, these results would suggest and which other measurements would you obtain to support your diagnosis. No, it's not animating, I'm sorry. So I'll give, uh, I'll give a little bit of time for you guys to think about this. And then the answer is already there on the slide and I apologize for not being animated. It was supposed to be given in sequence or question first and the answer later. So measurement of the TLC, we did, we kind of did this already with the other questions. So the TLC is the addition of vital capacity plus RV. And we don't have the RV, but we can back calculate RV by looking at FRC and ERV. And RV is FRC minus ERV. So we have vital capacity, which is three liters. And then FRC is five liters and ERV is one liter. So we get three plus five minus one, it's four. So the total of seven liters. So the TLC of seven liters seems elevated. Perhaps, but perhaps more importantly, the FRC is very elevated, right? We're giving you reference values here, three to four liters should be normal. And residual volume, the normal value for residual volume is usually around two liters. And the residual volume also looks very elevated, four liters instead of two liters. So those two values, or those few values, I should say, TLC being high, RV being very, very high, and FRC being high, suggest that there is RV over TLC ratio is elevated, which is typically a weak sign of obstruction. So these values to me suggest that the patient has obstructive lung disease 
And the proper way to diagnose obstructive lung disease is to obtain FEV1 and FVC values, and perhaps more importantly, the FEV1 over FVC ratio. So I'm suspicious that this individual has obstructive lung disease based on air trapping and hyperinflation. And I would get FEV1, FVC, and FEV1 over FVC ratio to um, better evaluate and confirm that the obstruction is truly present. Okay, so this is a little more interpretation now. Those were more, more like a easier questions, if you will. And now we're going to try to interpret this data. So FVC is 80% predicted. FEV1 is 50% predicted. FEV1 over FVC is 55% or, point, or 0 0.55. And then FEF 2575 is given here. Perhaps again, it's um, not necessary to, uh, to uh, evaluate that. Like I said, ATS and ERS are de-emphasizing the importance of those values. So those values are 40% predicted and are reduced as well. So what's the most likely diagnosis here? like I'm zooming through this really, really fast, no pun intended. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to spend a little more time on each question to allow you guys to have enough time for your own assessment before I give the full answer. So to me, the answer is D, chronic bronchitis, because this individual has obstructive lung disease. And um, the hallmark of obstructive lung disease is FEV1 over FVC ratio being reduced, and it's certainly reduced here. It's 55 or, or point, 0 0.55, and it should be 0 0.7 or greater. So there is evidence of obstruction. Uh, there may be some restriction, but it's hard to judge that restriction simply on the um, on these parameter values and FVC is almost normal. So I have to assume that this is obstruction only and no other concomitant illnesses. And the only real diagnosis here that gives me obstruction is chronic bronchitis. So I'm going to go with D, chronic bronchitis. Okay. So the next one uh, is also from that website, the respiratorytherapyzone.com. I found these questions relatively easy, but uh, hopefully more um, in line with the type of questions that you guys get rather than the type of questions I get for my boards. So FRC is measured by body platysmography and is 30% larger than that measured by helium dilution. This difference is best explained by an increase in which of the following? Kind of discuss this a little bit. Why would you ever get get body platysmography, and what is it that you're looking for in body platysmography? So hopefully this is a relatively easy question to answer. Doctor Zaza, he's uh, a lot of people are answering the answers in the chat, so I'll give you a little. Okay. Well, that. kudos so to you I guys. Would say for the questions for these things, you might want to put it in chat, but other th that only for these questions, not everything. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm seeing a lot of C here from April and Jennifer, and the that answer is correct. So correct answer for this one, for this particular question. I, I saw some Ds there. Hopefully that was from for the previous question. So I see a lot of Cs, and that's the correct answer because we're looking for residual value. So. Body platysmography allows you to have a more accurate assessment of residual volume. So the correct answer here would be C, residual volume. Kudos to all of those that answer that. Do they get an extra um, point or extra credit for giving the correct answer at the end of this uh, They get a free exercise? trip to Kana, all inclusive. They get an extra uh -huh. CEU. <laughs> extra CEU for giving correct answer. Okay. Oh, guys, we're joking. So next question, the largest volume of gas that can be expired from a resting and expiratory level 
is known as in my handy dandy chart we talked about this let's see what the chat says so i see some d's and some a's somebody said c so expiratory reserve volume can be measured, but it's not the largest volume. So to me, the largest volume is the difference between RV and TLC, right? But then, then they're asking from resting and expiratory level. So largest volume of gas that can be expired or exhaled from a resting and expiratory level. So some of this language can be a little bit confusing. But we basically, at the end of normal expiration, and then we ask the individual to fully exhale again. So that would be expiratory reserve volume. A is the correct answer, expiratory reserve volume. So extra credit to all of those guys that answered A. Next question. The total amount of gas in the lungs following a maximum inspiration is described as out of A's, whoever answered A gets an A today. So the correct answer is A, total lung capacity. I thought this was relatively easy, but we just put in there. Like I said, this is more for a warm up. So, so the volume of gas in saying, the lungs that yeah. can can be exhaled from end expiratory level during normal or tidal breathing. This is kind of similar to the one that we did two questions ago. Functional residual capacity. I think that's the correct answer here. All right. The volume of gas which remains in the lung at the end of maximum expiration is known as. A lot of A students here today. Excellent. So the correct answer is A. I think this is real. This was also relatively easy. Good job, guys. So now we're moving to a more complex portion. Of, of this section, which is actually reading the flow volume loop. And, and this is gonna be difficult to put in, in a chat uh, for this reason. And here's my question that I also made up for, uh, for medical students. And I have to apologize, my drawing skills were not very good when I drew this. So this flow volume loop looks like a large egg rather than a nice flow volume loop, but forgive my drawing abilities. The point of this exercise is the following. Trying to understand and see rather, what can we actually measure by looking at the flow volume? So here we have point A is tidal breathing. So this little loop here, this tiny little loop over here represents tidal breathing. This zero point is absolute zero. It's an arbitrary point where there is no more air left in the lung. Obviously, in a living, breathing individual, the lung volume will never be zero. But let's assume that this arbitrary point is the point where the lung volume is zero. And then each one of these hash marks, and I don't have a hash mark here, but each one of these hash marks represents one liter point. So from here to here will be, let's see, seven or eight points, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points from here to here. So let's see how many different pulmonary function test values can we actually express, exhibit, show on this flow volume loop. And typically I would give this diagram to my students to take home. And when they come back, this will be their homework to draw or, or, or uh, answer their questions that way. 
So obviously we're not going to have that kind of interaction today, but I thought that this was um, still a very interesting way to look at flow volume loop. So I'm going to spend another minute or two to let you guys think about this, and then I'll give my answer. So it's 4:39 now. When the when my clock on my cell phone rings 4:40, I'll go with the answer. If you guys want more time to think about this, uh, let me know. I think we're still a little bit ahead of time, so we can spend another extra minute or two on this particular question if you find this interesting or challenging. Okay, so I do have 440 on my clock. Let me see what everybody else is saying in the chat. TLC is seven liters, RV is about two liters, FPC about five liters. Excellent, excellent. So those, all of those are correct answers. Let's try to see this on a diagram. So hopefully the next slide will, I will have a better diagram to explain this to you. And I have a smaller version of the question up here in the right corner and a better version of a flow volume loop with better interpretation here as well. So here we have point, the beginning of the inhalation or the end of expiration is here. And between here and zero is residual volume. So if I count the hash marks on my diagram, that will be two liters. Between here, the maximum expiration, and here, maximum inspiration is vital capacity. And if I count my hash marks, that would be five hash marks. That's five liters. So a lot of correct answers in the chat. Good job, guys. And then I have the tidal breathing, and this looks like about half a hash mark here for the tidal breathing. So I'm gonna say the tidal volume is about one liter. Then I have, I think I have FRC here next on my, on my list of things. So FRC is at the end of normal exhalation during tidal breathing to residual volume. So that volume is about half a hash, one hash, so about one and a half hash marks. I'm sorry, for FRC, it's actually should be two liters for FRC. ERV is one and a half liters. I, I messed that one up. So FRC is from end of expiration to residual volume. That should be two liters. ERV is from the end of expiration to the RV. And then IRV will give me 2.5 liters. So now I have a whole bunch of actual PFTs to read. And I'm gonna stop right here. And for each question like this, I'll wait till the next um, minute point on my, on my cell phone clock. So I feel like I give you enough time. Like I said, I have about half a dozen of these too. So hopefully we'll finish a few minutes before five o'clock and we'll have some time for questions. And I'm sure that um, you all need a little bit of a break before the next session. So interpretation, FEV1 over vital capacity is low. FEV1 percent, 20% seems very low. Vital capacity is also low, but the key here is, yes, both FEV1 and vital capacity are low, but the ratio nonetheless is very, very low. The ratio of FEV1 over vital capacity is way below 0 0.7. So we're gonna call that obstructive lung disease. On the scale of severity, this looks like a very severe lung disease because FEV1 is very reduced. TLC is elevated, probably on the basis of RV being very elevated. And then DLC is also very reduced. So interpretation, obstructive lung disease, very severe with hyperinflation and significant gas exchange abnormalities. Final diagnosis, probably COPD. Again, we're not supposed to give full diagnosis based on the PFTs, but this would be most consistent with COPD and large boule, and large boule come from the fact that this person is very hyperinflated. 
Next one. I'll wait a little bit to give you a chance to fully evaluate these PFTs. Okay, I have 445 on my phone, so let's give a full answer on interpreting these, these values. FE1 over FVC is oof, so close to normal, just on the verge. FEV1 seems reduced though, 69% predicted. Bottle capacity is normal, just about. TLC is also normal, just about, just barely about 80% mark, right? And DLC also appears to be relatively normal, maybe even increased. So if anything, this looks like very, very mild obstructive lung disease and DLCO is preserved. So I have to think about which obstructive lung diseases gives me preserved, preserved DLCO. And that's probably asthma. Let's see what everybody else is saying in asthma, mild airflow obstruction, asthma, beautiful. You guys are Pros, moderate obstruction. So I don't know if moderate obstruction based on timing of this answer applies to this um, PFT is not uh, rather pre not previous. I would say probably mild, mild to moderate. Um, I'm not gonna argue about 1% difference here. So this is asthma, obstructive lung disease with preserved gas transfer, asthma, very good. How about this one? Okay, chat is, people are putting stuff in the chat. Restrictive, restrictive ILD. Yes. Correct answers. Let's see what everybody says. Mild obstruction. No, that must be the old one. So everybody that says restrictive is correct. Just close this chat. So moderately severe restrictive lung disease based on the fact that FEV1 over FBC is preserved. And then we go over to TLC and TLC is reduced and vital capacity is also reduced. And the other important factor here is the DLCO is severely reduced, perhaps out of proportion to the other values. You see how these values, FEV1, vital capacity, TLC, they are kind of in the moderate to severe range, moderately severe range, somewhere in the 50 to 60% range. And then you come to DLCO, and if DLCO was also 50, 55%, 60% predicted, then it would be in line or proportional to that. But what DLCO tells me is that there's something else going on in terms of uh, destruction of the pulmonary parenchyma or maybe pulmonary vascular disease that's above and beyond of just simple restriction. So this one will be something like IPF, something like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or maybe individual with combination of some type of ILD, restrictive lung disease, and pulmonary hypertension. So far, we're doing great because you guys are giving all the correct answers. I think I have one tricky one in there. And if you get that one, then um, I have nothing else to add. Okay. On the next minute mark on my cell phone, I'll start talking and giving answer. Here we go. Let me just check the chat. IL, RLD, hopefully meaning uh, restrictive lung disease. ILD will be also correct answer. So this is uh, this seems similar to the previous one. To me, the DLCO here is not as dramatically reduced. Uh, it's more in line, although still a little bit disproportionate to 
the other values. So the whole mark again is FEV1 over FEC is preserved. So therefore it's probably not obstructive disease. FEV1 and FEC are proportionally reduced. So that's giving me a normal ratio here. TLCO is decreased, which is reinforcing the point that this is restrictive lung disease and DLCO is also reduced perhaps slightly disproportionately to the rest of the values. So here we go, next slide. Moderate restrictive lung disease with moderate decrease in gas transfer. So this is a good example of sarcoidosis. Although a lot of times sarcoidosis can also have airway involvement. So don't be surprised if an individual with sarcoidosis has a mixed restrictive obstructive lung disease. Let me just check the chat before we go to the next question in case that there is some kind of question or need for further explanation. I think we're good with the chat. So we'll go on with the next question. So how about this one, guys? FEV1 over FVC reduced. All the numbers seem very, very reduced. Think about this one. I give an answer or next minute mark on my cell phone. Chat goes from nothing to 15 answers in about three seconds. Mixed, obstructive, missed, obstructive and restrictive. So whoever said obstructive is correct. Whoever said restrictive is also correct, but whoever said mixed is the champion because this is truly a mixed um, lung disease because we have uh, evidence of obstruction. FEV1 over FEC is reduced. And then these numbers are proportionately reduced, perhaps a little bit disproportionately, FEV1 being more reduced than the vital capacity. But when we come over to TLC, TLC is also reduced. So if this was pure obstruction like asthma, TLC, TLC should be normal. If this was more COPD patient, TLC may actually be increased because of hyperinflation and air trapping. Uh, but TLC in this particular individual is reduced. So we have a mixed lung disease with severely reduced gas transfer. So in terms of what this could be clinically, we have to talk about or think about rather individuals that may have mixed airway disease and pulmonary parenchymal disease. So like I said previously, sarcoidosis may be a good example for this because sarcoidosis can often involve both airways and pulmonary parenchyma. Or another perhaps uh, common scenario would be two diseases happening together. So COPD on one end causing obstruction and IPF on the other end causing restriction. Uh, obviously, I couldn't make that diagnosis based on the PFTs. Like I said, this could easily be sarcoidosis with airway, inv airway involvement, but hopefully the constellation of other uh, clinical data such as smoking history, uh, some uh, maybe CAT scan results, maybe patient symptoms would also be helpful in making that final diagnosis of whether this is something that affects both um, airways and parenchyma like sarcoidosis, or maybe two completely separate and completely different and independent diseases, one causing obstruction and another causing restriction. Okay, so next one. So here we have basically same patient, not basically, same patient, just two different values. Uh, let's say one was obtained during um, regular office visit, and the other is obtained when the patient is acutely ill in the hospital. And uh, we say you shouldn't get the PFTs on acutely ill patient, but let's say we got imaginary PFTs, or maybe we somehow managed to get PFTs on this patient when he was ill in the hospital. I can't believe the chat is already talking about this question. No, it must be the previous one. Okay. 454, I give the answer. Oh, that came too quick. We'll give another minute. This is really complex one. And I think it's the last one, which gives me an extra five minutes for, this, for questions and other discussions. So I'll give until 455 on my cell phone when I give answer. So 
I think you guys have been doing great with general interpretation. So the trick of this question would be what happened to DLCO? What would explain such a dramatic jump in DLCO? Let's see what chat is saying. A lot of you guys are saying mixed obstructive restrictive, which is appropriate, which is fine, but that doesn't make it any different than um, the previous uh, the previous question that we had when we had a mixed obstructive restrictive lung disease. So overall interpretation is correct. FEV1, FVC actually looks a little bit on the restrictive side. I don't see a whole lot of obstruction here but obstruction may be hidden on the basis of RV over TLC and things like that. So I can't completely exclude obstruction, but doesn't kind of doesn't smell like obstructive disease here. Seems mostly restrictive. FEV1 and FVC are both reduced. The ratio is preserved. TLC is definitely low. And we have DLCO um, reduction also at 57%. So it looks like straightforward restrictive lung disease with decreased um, gas transfer. So that's the first one. But what happened in the second one? Every, every value got a little bit worse. FEV1 dropped, FVC dropped, TLC dropped. Okay, so I understand that's the fact that the patient's not feeling so well, but what made the DLC go up? And I think I saw one, maybe two individuals in the chat saying pulmonary hemorrhage, and that's, that is the correct answer. So this individual has lupus or SLE stands for systemic lupus erythematosus. And a lot of times those patients develop alveolar hemorrhage. And that's probably the reason A, why the person's feeling sick and getting admitted to the hospital, but that's probably a good explanation as to why DLCO jumped from 57% to 112% predicted. So one more and I think we finish and um, this one looks pretty straightforward too. It's just trying to put in the DLCO into the puzzle and maybe make some clinical correlation with all the different values. So here ratio is normal. Both FEV1 and FBC are reduced, but the ratio is normal. So it looks like restrictive lung disease. We come over to TLC and the TLC is reduced. So it looks like restrictive lung disease, but then we come to DLCO and DLCO is normal. So which restrictive lung diseases give us relatively preserved DLCO? Mild restrictive is perfect answer. Uh, well, mild restrictive is a good answer. I should say the perfect answer would be to tie that in together with the DLCO being preserved and not reduced with neuromuscular disease. So again, you can't really make a diagnosis of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy based on PFTs, but, but the point is that DLCO, relatively preserved DLCO with restricted lung volumes suggests that there may be a neuromuscular disease. Okay, I come, I've come to an end in my discussion, in my lecture and then interpretation. I leave you with um, a number of wonderful articles. The first one by Stanovich, I quoted a lot during today's discussion. It's very recent, uh, less than a year or so, uh, published in European Respiratory Journal. I don't think you need a uh, sub subscription to be able to access it. I believe I access it myself without any subscription. Some of these articles come out, you don't have to pay for them. It's a lovely article. I think it's a worth a read. It's about 30 pages long. The other five articles that I give you here were published almost 20 years ago in European Respiratory Journal, and this is ATS-ERS joint guidelines, if you will, how to read, how to perform PFTs. And these are uh, five very, very long articles. So you have to be very dedicated to learning PFTs in order to read these five articles, or they're great if you can't sleep 
at two o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, you start reading one of these, no problem. <laughs> so I thank you for your attention. And uh, Terry and Al, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. And I'll be happy to answer your questions, although I realize that I have about 30 seconds left between the next session. That was great, Dr. Cohen. Yeah, it's great. It's great, Saza. Great. Thanks. Nice job. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to end this presentation, but you, we're still live. <laughs>